Good morning. Thank you, Jeff, for uh, bringing me here. It was a fortuitous encounter this summer, and I really welcome the opportunity and the challenge to come speak to you about this topic. It was a very great sense of support that uh, Jeff Morrison felt that the ideas I had presented uh, were useful to this community, and it's at an important time because some of these issues are uh, are important in shaping our future and your future as well. So uh, as Jeff mentioned, I'm very proud to wave the flag of the Human Computer Interaction Lab, which I founded 40 years ago at the University of Maryland. And it's an interdisciplinary group between computer science and the rapidly growing College of Information Studies, plus other groups around campus, including the wonderfully titled Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, MIF. Uh, and so that's a kind of <laughs> Proud group. There's a thousand papers on our website. There's uh, two, 300 videos and 200 project pages. So there's a lot for you to look at. And uh, the book uh, Jeff kindly mentioned, uh, Designing the User Interface, tells the story now in sixth edition. Um, and I've had to have five co authors to help tell the story of the remarkable success of this discipline in shaping the world that we use and the fact that some six billion people have something in their pocket like this that they actually can use. Uh, so the, the book tells the story about the theories, the principles, the guidelines, and the devices that actually succeed to make these technologies work for us. And that's a lot of lessons there that I will draw on. Uh, the particular things, I mean, as Jeff mentioned, um, our work on hypertext in 85, and those light blue links you know, of, uh, that you click on, those were our work in 1985, and Tim Berners-Lee, we, we built a commercial product called Hyperties, and Tim Berners-Lee saw that, and that's in his manifesto for the web in spring 89. So we know the, tra you know, the trajectory for that to happen, and, and you know, he was a colleague, and uh, he did a remarkable, you know, creative contribution. Also, those little keyboards, those tiny three-inch keyboards, when we were working on this in 88, Keyboards on the screen were like, you know, inch size buttons, square inch buttons. And we started with a nine inch keyboard, a seven inch, five inch, and three inch keyboard. And the strategy was very simple. It was one of those, we did not change the hardware, but if you put your finger on most of those screens, they activate when you land on. And our innovation was that when you touch it, you get a cursor above your finger and you can slide it or wiggle your finger and you activate on lift off, and that's still what's on your Apple phone. So Steve Jobs visited our lab, and I was a consultant for Apple, so I saw how that one happened. So sometimes little, little ideas can have a very uh, powerful impact. I also hold a patent on photo tagging and that, that early design, which has been expanded and improved by so many cases. So these are good uh, topics to discuss. And, cocktail parties and airport lounges, but much of the work, and I hope some of you know the work of you know, my career, has been about complex information visualization systems for experienced professionals and analysts who are trying to understand complex data situations. And so Spotfire was our early work starting in 94, the company in 97, we grew to 200 people, and then that was bought. So it was a, as an academic, it was a great sense of satisfaction to understand how you take an idea how you take a research paper, how you start a company, and the people who actually did it, my former student and buddies, I learned a lot from them, uh, but it was one of those nice, uh, important processes. So uh, that idea of multiple windows and a set of slider, dynamic query sliders that you move, and as you slide them, all these windows and you know, or, or 25 windows will all update simultaneously within 150 milliseconds. So that was the strategy and the technology for exploring the data. Uh, and that implemented and other companies such as Tableau and Palantir and others followed that. Uh, you know, Tableau's become this huge success recently getting bought out at $15 billion. So that's kind of a success of that visual way of thinking. The tree maps is showing the stock market and uh, you know, show you all the information. The area for each box is the market capitalization of each company, and the color shows its change in price from the previous day. Red stocks are going down. You can see certain sectors like utilities were down on this day. The green stocks are going up, and 
big companies include Apple and Google and Facebook and so on. So that concentration of putting a lot of information in a small amount of space became a very powerful notion. A, a compact display uh, that presents a lot of information is extremely helpful. Uh, we went worked on network data. This shows the, the sort of patterns of voting within the, the US Senate. It was one of the early ones of these, and the red Republicans were all tightly together. The blue Democrats were all tightly together. And there were three Republicans uh, uh, who would sometimes vote over. And this was 2007, and that predicted the 2009 vote on Obama's uh, re rebuilding plan. So that's become the most widely used network visualization tool. It's embedded in Excel. And we just came out with the second edition. And this copy is for Jeff in appreciation. Yeah. For <laughs> so uh, that just came out, and it's the most widely used uh, visualization tool for teaching, and it's used in a lot of analysis situations, especially Twitter, Facebook, and social media uh, analytics. Uh, the last ten years were more focused on medical systems, and this showing patterns of multiple patients, thousands of patients, and the ways they were treated. This shows a study that was done at, in, at Children's Hospital here in D.C and the patterns for intakes in the emergency room. There's a strict pattern that they're supposed to follow. And as you can see, less than half of the patients got the right pattern. And there were 29 forms of violations of the strategies. And that was a complete revelation to the managers of the, sorry, turn that off. <laughs> um, so the idea, you know, and I see, you know, understanding how failures occur, you can't quite write a program to do that, but the visual representation shows you those 29 different forms of failure. And anytime you have sequential sets of processes like medical treatments or sports or military performance, you're going to be able to use these kind of event analytic strategies. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased that that's kind of gone forward and in, inspired a good deal of work. So that's where I've come from. But that's kind of just setting the stage and sort of take a breath now and sort of think some big thoughts. So the sort of setting stage for this talk is sort of takes me back to uh, a, a, an ongoing debate that's gone on for 2,000 years and goes back to Aristotle. Uh, and you know, the idea of rationalism is one form of thinking that you can make sense of the world in a rational way and that you can solve the world and a set of logical principles will then govern your action and they are permanent and durable and effective, okay? And uh, the, the alternate view was empiricism and the idea that you need to continuously update your belief because context change, realities change, your understanding change, people change. So it's a much more fluid world and therefore you have to connect with the world and you have to study the real world as it is, not your fantasy of what it should be, okay? Aristotle had many things that he did derive positive insights, but he got some things wrong too. I mean, famously, he knew men had 32 teeth and he thought women had 28 because, well, of course they did. And he had, you know, other kind of mistaken beliefs. And so the rationalism model, which is productive and positive, can also be counterproductive. And empiricism has its strength and weaknesses at all as well. But I'm suggesting that, you know, Leonardo and Galileo have important lessons for how we see the world and how we should think about it, as do Aristotle and Descartes. I mean, no, no argument. And in this century, maybe Ronald Fisher, the statistician who, you know, developed the methods that we use for empirical testing, represent that belief. And maybe from the empiricist side, John Tukey, the famous statistician who represented the use of visualization. So the idea that you should see the data, you should explore the data, you should understand it. And that's kind of more generalized that the AI and HCI are these alternate views. Again, both have value, but both have, are missing something. And so you want to take both of these ways of looking at the world in to be able to craft systems that will be effective for all of us, okay? So that's the sort of the broad reach the narrower story is AI is this monster thing that's happened in the last decades. And, you know, but it's been going on for a while. And for the last 70 years, AI and general AI you know, was coming 20 years from now. And it's always been 20 years off in the distance. But the journalists loved it and Hollywood loved it. 
and the belief that machines could think, maybe going back, you know, Turing's article in 1950 that asked the question, can machines think, gave us that thread and promoted that idea, a useful idea, but a limiting idea at the same time. So I want you to get both of those scenarios in. Now, you know, the, the, the enthusiasm for AI is enormous worldwide. And, you know, it's, it's a, these are some of the many books on this topic I won't even go bother to discuss. But, you know, the enthusiasm is also has skeptics. And maybe the best one is Kathy O'Neill's book, Weapons of Math Destruction, where she very effectively lays out the ways bias in algorithms can lead you into trouble, whether her examples are mortgage lending or hiring and firing of employees or parole or other kind of things. Her examples are compelling and her, her influence has been profound. So that's really my favorite. There are these others that go on. Uh, and then, you know, there's here closer to home, uh, the DOD has focused on AI and autonomy is, seems to be a big part of it. And that sort of led our discussions here. In 2012, Defense Science Board talked about the role of autonomy and that discussion had been going on for many years before that. This June 2016 report and 2018 are all instructive. And actually they have a lot of wisdom in them. They do talk about AI with enthusiasm and autonomous systems with enthusiasm. They also talk about the human side and the human, human factors and the design for human systems. However, I do have some trouble with this path of thinking and that's what I'm here to try out. I hope you'll engage with me constructively in thinking because the, the side about autonomy and the way of thinking leads us into danger sometimes. And so that's where I want to, I hope to change or open your thinking to some other possibilities. So I'm not happy, the, the language actually shapes a lot of what we do. We're talking, we're gonna talk more about responsibility and agency and control and decision making in a little while. But you know, the idea that computers can, can be collaborators, teammates or partners seems to me dangerous. Okay, so I'm here to say that that worries me and that I value the unique capabilities that humans have, the unbounded creativity, flawed though they are, there's still something very different between a human and a machine. And machines cannot have responsibility. I think we pretty much got that in a discussion before, pretty much accepted, but it took a few minutes to get that registered. But responsibility is an important distinguishing feature and it will be a way, I hope, to convince you that you will improve design by recognizing that only humans are responsible, that machines are never responsible for anything that happens. And in a military world, that's consequential. That chain of command matters, and after action reports matter, and understanding what cause, what the root causes are, is really important. So that's where we're going. And just recently, last week, this book came out. You might want to take a look at it. Uh, but it really makes, it's interesting. The first half of the book I'm very enthusiastic about. It's a pretty powerful teardown of a lot of AI systems and talks about the failures of those AI systems in consequential situations, whether it's Tesla cars or Microsoft's Tay, you know, chat robot and other situations and visual, um, you know, and, and, and visual recognition systems that don't work or don't get it right all the time or could be misled very easily. And so those are gonna be, you know, consequential examples. Uh, Gary Marcus is an NYU professor of uh, uh, psychology who formed a company called Geometric Intelligence that was bought by Uber, and now he's starting another company, uh, uh, you know, on, on, on these topics. So he's been around talking about it, but I think the book, the first half is particularly potent because it really has, with lots and lots of examples. Where I differ is he believes in doubling down on AI and that deep understanding is the goal and possible, and I'm suggesting as I hope you'll, I hope I'll convince some of you that there is another way to think about the future. It's not about machines that are more intelligent. It's not about artificial general intelligence. We're not going to have machines replacing us, doing what we are. You know, I don't believe in singularity scenarios, and I think that the future is about amplifying, augmenting, enhancing, and empowering people, so as to build their self-efficacy. That's the 
sort of larger language. Okay, so uh, you know, as opposed to AI, I would say HCI Pride is serving six billion users, and we've done that in this community because we respected and appreciated the diversity of users, old and young, men and women, literate and illiterate, and able and, and, and not able, and so thinking about how to make tools that serve widespread people, widespread sets of users, and I like the word tools very much. I think it's a better choice. It's a flawed choice, but it's a good choice to make about the design of technologies. They are tools, no matter how sophisticated they are. Um, then we've also, the, the world of, of HCI had looked at diverse applications, but always grounded with real problems, real users, real data, not imagined scenarios. And then diverse interfaces which were built on theories, principles, and guidelines. And I'll just steer you, I think the way HCI succeeded with six billion people was, you know, those few thousand researchers produced a few tens of thousands of papers which got encoded into a set of design guidelines which were then used to drive the tools and the two million apps or on your Apple or, you know, store were guided by a set of principles. The Apple guidelines make it very clear that the goal is user control. People, not apps, are in control. Okay, it's a simple phrase, but I just want to sort of come back to people are in control and therefore responsible, okay? And then flexibility. Give users complete fine grade control over their work. That's what drove the success of the large number of apps and the mobile devices and the digital cameras and and you know, other devices that became widely used. Now, these may seem simple in consumer environments, but I think the same principles apply for the rich, powerful tools that, you know, of information visualization, as well as the complex, highly dynamic tools that you have to consider in, in military situations, okay? So, you know, the AI design principles, which I wanna change, are there's two key ones. The humanoid robots have been a notion, and I'm not gonna go into that today, but you know, it's an idea that just has not played out uh, for 250 years. It's a consistent form of sort of fantasy, and uh, the, those machines of 1770 that were built that drew pictures, that wrote poems, that played musical instruments, they become merely the museum pieces for the next century, okay? Hollywood has embraced this idea. Entertainment approaches are fine. Uh, Walt Disney, audio animatronics, but I don't think you want humanoid robotics on your ships or you know, in your planes or in your offices. I just don't think that's gonna go. And uh, we could go further, but that's not today's talk. The more important one is excessive automation. And here, the current poster child is a 737 MAX a design which had deadly consequences. One could label it killer robots or deadly AI uh, if you want. Uh, and, and there's many scenarios about what went wrong on those two crashes, but uh, essentially I would, my interpretation is as a design uh, story, that the design of this interface, I mean, motivated by <clears throat> the pressure that Boeing had from its customers who wanted larger planes, longer distance, more efficient, and so, the original 737 had a 50-inch intake for the turbofans, and the new ones have a 90-inch intake. Those big intakes no longer fit under the low wing. They moved the, uh, the engine forward and up, and that caused instability, which potentially could lead to stall, and Boeing thought its solution would be autonomous. Okay, without informing the pilots, without Try, because that's what the customers wanted. We don't want to retrain our pilots, okay? Uh, they made a design which did not give pilots adequate status information about what the plane was doing and insufficient display of information about what they, their options were, okay? They could have shut it down if they knew about that, but they never, never dawned on them. Other pilots in the past who had faced the situation had, you know, had actually done that but in these two crashes, that's what happened, as far as we understand, okay? Now, uh, there's other kind of issues here. There's a sort of central feature, as you know, the angle of attack indicator was flawed in this case, and for some reason, the designers built the system dependent only on a single angle of attack uh, indicator. 
And that's another sort of central design flaw of human factors history that we all should have known. They should have known better, but they didn't because they believed that they could build an autonomous system that would solve the problem. And they didn't think that they needed to either you know, have multiple uh, sensors or that they needed to provide indications to the pilots of status or options. Those are the, the, the key things, okay? So, um, and, and they should have known better because there are in aviation history, there's 1,200 failures of angle of attack uh, sensors and there's 140 of them on 737s alone. So this is not hidden news, this is something they should have known. And every designer should know. But I believe that the current thinking about AI and autonomy shifts designers, engineers, developers to have a belief that somehow they could make this thing work. That the rational approach, that writing a program which was tested and would work under these set of circumstances would always work. And when the context changes, when the sensors don't work, when something goes wrong that's unexpected, there is not sufficient recourse. Okay? So that's kind of my version. There's other versions of the 737 crash. But my concern and my focus today is what I would consider excessive automation. I'm in favor of automation. Automation is wonderful. I've been working on it all my career. But there are sometimes it gets to be excessive. And so that's what we have to understand. And that's what I hope to show you a way to think about it. So what I want to do, OK, I mean, there's some other problems down below, but we'll stay away from those. What I want to achieve, and I focus again about the human operator, the human in control, to amplify, augment, enhance, and empower people, and to produce what we've done, what technology has always done, thousandfold amplifications, improvements, and capabilities. That's what the web provides. That's what Wikipedia offers. That's what search does. That's what email and text do. That's what digital photographs. That's what you know, computer navigation. They give me powers that I'm now a thousand times more powerful than I ever was before. They are tools for me to use, for me to choose, that make me stronger and better. Okay, the new tool, I had a business formation or, you know, that the, the, the idea that you can start a business online with lots of ways. You can do it through Etsy and eBay and Airbnb and Uber and Lyft, et cetera, one after another. Or you can do GoFundMe or Kickstarter. There's so many empowering ways and that's what we should be looking for. Technologies that empower and amplify human abilities. However, the central design I we'll call TRS, trusted, reliable, and safe. That's your goal. If you know it's going to work, it's reliable, and you're, you're, it's trusted, and it's safe, you will use it. Otherwise, you will back off. Now, the larger goal is to make more people more creative more often. So I'm after amplifying humans' ability to be creative. And then you're going to build that sense of self-efficacy that I'm in charge, I'm in control, I can do what I need to do, and then you bring the societal benefits. So that's kind of the larger frame. But let's get down to more specifics. So that first edition that Jeff said he has on his shelf of the book uh, had a chapter that discussed the issue. And the thinking, uh, my thinking, was influenced very much by the writings and work of Tom Sheridan, MIT professor. I hope many of you know him for 40 years. He was really a dominant thinker about the way to design technologies. And he had a scale of 10 levels of automation, from human control upwards to complete computer automation. And I sort of took that as the way to think about it. And the chapter I wrote was called Balancing Automation and Human Control. And the notion was that you had to choose in your design some point, whether you think of 10 steps or more, but you were choosing some point between human control and computer automation. Okay? And that eventually the goal was to get more and more computer automation. And that's where we were moving towards. And a few years ago I began to feel uncomfortable with this notion. Okay? And it struck me 
And I began to write, when I got to the fifth and sixth edition, the section title changed. And it became ensuring human control while increasing automation. Now that sounds like a little bit of a puzzle. How can you do that? How do you get there? It seems like they're in contradiction because we're so immersed in the idea there's a single scale. And I'm suggesting there's two scales. That's a two-dimensional model. And this opens up some possibilities. And you can have computer control or human control. You can have low and high levels of automation. And the governing force of how it plays out is how well you design it. So let's start with the humble thermostat, OK? Is the humble thermostat a way of automating and giving computer control to the room temperature? Or is it a way in which I take control of the temperature of the room by setting it? I'm using some automation for me to set the, the, the room temperature. OK, and it's a simple control, or used to be. <laughs> you set 76 degrees, and you get 76 degrees. OK, when it's well designed, it's simple, it's clear. You know the status. You know it's now 74 degrees, and you want 76. You turn the dial up, and you get an indication that the heater has gone on. And so you have the informative feedback that tells you you're getting to where you're going. An elevator. You get in the I got in the elevator today. I press the button. The light goes on. It says, "Yeah, I got your, got your press." If, if the light didn't go on, I'd be pressing that button again and again, right? So you sort of get the feedback that your action is there, and you can see here it's on the tenth floor, coming down to the first floor. And when it arrives at the first floor, bing, the door opens. I get feedback. And this well-developed, and then you go into the elevator, you press 14, the light goes on, the door is closed, and it shows you where you're going. And we've come to accept it because it's trustable, reliable, and safe. Okay? Now, when it fails these things, fails these opportunities, then you get really scared and you don't go in the elevator. Okay? So a story came to me you know, about an elevator in India. This woman from the West runs up to the elevator and puts her hand in to stop it from closing because she believes there's a sensor that will stop it from closing. But it doesn't, and it crushes her arm. And they said, what happened? Isn't it supposed to be? Yeah, but the, they don't do that in India. It's not, you know, not part of that. And the inspector doesn't check that. So once you break down and you no longer have a safe system, these bad things happen. And people's expectations are shaped, and we want to build systems that are comprehensible, predictable, and controllable, so as to get trusted, reliable, and safe systems. That's kind of the language I'm using. So here's where it is, this two-dimensional thing. And when I gave the talk in June, this is what I used. But I've now come to see it in a different way. So I'd like to present it as a two-dimensional layout. And there's uh, what I come to see now is the landscape of automation. And the goal is to get to high levels of human control and high levels of automation at the same time, but well-designed automation. So here's where we're going. So the landscape of automation is what I'll describe it. Now, there are some times where you really want rapid action that's totally reliable, like airbag deployment. Okay, It has to happen in 100 milliseconds, and there's no time for that level of control. And military situations will sometimes have these challenges to face. So you may be in that part of the landscape. Um, I should say that there's, there's other parts of the landscape I haven't illustrated. Let me just back up and say this. Some lightweight things like movie recommenders and book recommenders and restaurant recommenders and all those kind of lightweight recommenders are sort of one set of things. They're not so consequential. There's another set of recommenders of medical and legal and military and financial recommenders, which are more consequential. And they are another part of the space. And you know, there's dangers. There's some in, in that space, there are rapid actions. So the high-speed trading uh, becomes an option or some desired goal. But as we know, the flash crashes of 2010 and 2015 each triggered whatever, a few hundred billion dollars drop in market values because the assumptions were not played out correctly. It was a failure of these uh, automated systems. But I'm going to, I focused here, here in this landscape. Once we put aside those recommender notions, which are an import, important domain, I'm sort of talking about devices. Now, there's some times where you really don't want automation. You want to ride your bicycle, or you want to play the piano, or play a, a flute. 
and you don't want automation. Well, usually you don't want automation, but sometimes you just want to put on you know, Apple Music and listen to somebody else playing the piano, and you get automation that way. Uh, but I don't know, bicycle riding is sort of an example. I'm not sure there is going to be, is there an AI? Anybody working on AI bicycles that, that will drive themselves? It's sort of, I just, yes? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure there's much of a business in that one. Uh, but, you know, the idea that they're, they're uh, there are certain things you people want to do on their own, and we should respect that. And they may want to create art on their own, and some people want to do it with a brush, but some people will use automated tools, or a lot of people use digital cameras or any cameras to make art. So there's degrees of automation you may get, but I just want to remind you that there's a space in this landscape of things that people want to do on their own for which they don't want automation. So remember that. Now, you know, the current examples are there's cars and a self-driving car. So self-driving cars have moved higher levels of automation and presumably reducing the level of human control. And that's where I get into trouble. Okay, I recently rode a Tesla Model 3, uh, and the person who's doing the demo for me, I mean, she had bought this, she had waited for two and a half years to get her car, and she did get it. But she was frightened by some of the aspects of it because it took control away from her in situations that uh, she felt were unsafe. Uh, wisely, some of the design of this, uh, of the Tesla uh, uh, do uh, say, no, auto steering doesn't work in this environment. It's just too busy and too unpredictable. And the, it was actually in the streets of Boston. Uh, that didn't work out <laughs> so well. On the highway, it does a lot better, and it does very impressively. Nevertheless, as we know, you know, I, I, while I want to see a future of safe, trusted, reliable, and safe um, uh, cars, uh, because I think there's, there's great value in it, I'm not convinced that the current approach is going to produce that in, in the short term. And recently, there's been a pullback of predictions about when these things will happen. Uh, the 2016 Tesla crash, for which I would encourage you to read the NTSB report. It's a quite readable 60-page report about what went wrong there. We'll tell you some of the things. So there's cars and self-driving cars. The place we want to get to, I suggest, are TRS cars, trusted, reliable, and safe cars. And they will require a different design. Because the current design, Tesla says you have to keep your hands on the wheel, you have to pay attention, but not everybody does. So reaching in the back seat to get your laptop or listen to music or do something else uh, can be disastrous. And then because the way Tesla wrote its contract, they're not responsible. Okay, so there's another set of issues in medical devices as well as you know, a lot of software that the held harmless clauses and lack of you know, responsibility is, is impeding the progress towards trusted, reliable, and safe. So those are a couple. There's a lot more examples that we could look around this space. And in general, the goal, I think, of good design is to move to the upper right. And you want to do that as much as possible. So uh, I would say you can challenge this diagram. I don't have accurate measures of the degree of automation or the degree of control. I think a good research project around here would be to try to develop metrics. And there's some of that. I saw a description of that in some of the uh, ONR literature. So we want to understand how we get there. So pacemakers are an interesting example because they largely are autonomous, if you will, uh, but they can be monitored, they can be checked, and when they fail, we have to come to understand how they have failed and we want to make improvements. And then the increasing progress of pacemaker technology is allowing it to work in a richer set of conditions. I might say the airbag was another kind of interesting case. The early designs did save about 2,500 lives a year, but they killed about 200 babies and frail uh, older adults because they were the, the designer did not fully anticipate the things that could go wrong. And the newer designs that uh, you know, limit the, the employment of airbags in, in other situations were a step forward. So these are difficult issues. And I guess the question for self-driving cars, its future will probably be determined by the nature of the next 100 accidents that happen with these cars. And so um, I want them to succeed, and I think they'll do it better by giving uh, you know, well-designed systems that are trusted, reliable, and safe. And so we'll 
We'll see how that unfolds. Okay, so the takeaway message here is that we want high levels of human control and high levels of automation. That's kind of the, the, the strong point. And uh, yeah, okay. What, what level of reliability do we have to shoot for? Uh, <clears throat> say, take your car example. Yeah. Is it compared to an average driver, a good driver? Right. Compared to right. automation? Fair question. So the, the, the question is, I mean, if an automated car is the same level of performance as a human, uh, will that be acceptable? Probably not. If we still have 30,000 deaths per year, probably not acceptable. So there's a higher level of expectations. And I think, you know, we're, the, 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 as I say, the, first 100, the next 100 crashes will determine how well that, that plays out. So I think doing automated uh, cars on, you know, uh, highways that are entry control, access controlled is a much easier thing. Uh, what myself and others call closed systems. Elevators are pretty safe because they operate in a closed environment. So we've built that closed environment. And when you have a closed environment, such as an interstate highway with limited access and fencing so that animals don't cross or people don't cross, you have a better chance. And so actually one of the central shifts for the self-driving car world will be not just to improve the car, but to improve the environment. And it may actually take till we have car-to-car -car, uh, communications so that you have a full spectrum and also sensors embedded in the highway and highways reporting their status. So uh, I can't tell you the number, but I would say yes, people are focused on this. And so we will have to, uh, I think they have to perform much higher than human performance, but I don't have a number for you. Do you have an answer for that one? No. Okay, so I mean, I think you have to ask, what is, are you dealing with lightweight decisions, discretionary ones like choosing a movie or making a book recommendation, or is it consequential things like medical uh, or military uh, or other kind of life critical applications? So that's where, that's where it comes. So we want to really pay good attention to them. So we really want to do much better than existing systems. Okay, so I want trusted, reliable, and safe. And I say that comes from comprehensible, predictable, and controllable, an old phrase, continuous display of status and informative feedback. OK, so now I'm sort of going to take another breath here and get you to think a uh, larger thought and sort of talk about design principles. And 30 or 40 years ago, we already had a set of these principles that were described in place, the notions of comprehensible, predictable, and controllable. They're embedded in the well-used Apple, Microsoft, and more recently, Google. Uh, application, direct manipulation, a phrase that I coined of a visual representation of the world of action so that you could drag a file into a folder and see that it arrived there. You could stretch a window and see that it was a larger one or drag it back and forth. Remember, the early versions didn't have all those principles. It was Larry Tesler and Apple that added, in the days of slow machines, the dotted rectangles that would allow you to see where. Now you can actually drag the whole windows around. So we've learned how to make trusted, reliable, and safe that are comprehensible, predictable, and controllable. Yeah? Question on trusted, reliable, and safe. Can you give an example of a formal process where we've convinced people something is trusted, reliable, and safe, as opposed to just accepted it because Yeah. For the of it. So, I mean, the, the, these systems have overprotected, you know, elevators have multiple forms of <laughs> original failures of elevators where they would drop in the elevator shaft. And so you have multiple forms of break. The San Francisco cable cars have three forms of breaking to stop them from causing difficulties. And I think you have to over engineer to build those things. And then you have to demonstrate in the initial training and testing, and then in the early use. And I would say the key thing then, the key thing is having detailed audit trails of what happens. So the idea of a flight data recorder for every robot is what I want to see. Okay, so that's kind of, I'll come to that very shortly. Let me, let me actually, let me come back to that, see if I can get to that. So the, the, the three next parts of this pillar are, I'm going to talk about responsibility, social contexts, and then this broader notion of frontier thinking, and the goal is to make more people more creative more often with self-efficacy and societal benefit. So that's where we're going for this 
remaining section of the talk. So responsibility um, has a few parts to it, and the current language is pretty rich of accountability, liability, fairness, transparency, explainability, interpretability. These are all good words. And as I, in the last nine to 12 months, a huge upsurge of research on this topic, especially young researchers in the academic world, I see a tremendous growth. Of course, the DARPA Explainable AI program is one exemplar, and I think there's a growing interest in those kind of things. So I'm mostly supportive of that, and the explainability does lead to the trusted, reliable, and safe. If you understand what's happening, if it's comprehensible, predictable, and controllable, it becomes more acceptable. Now, the ways to achieve it, I mean, I'm not going to go deeply into, but at other places I've talked the technical things. So first is audit trails or product logs uh, to review failures and near misses. I mean, the, the safety of civil aviation is due in large part to those kind of retrospective analyses. And the NTSB, uh, as a trusted investigator, has made that a success story. A few other important things. I, I, you know, in another talk, I've talked about a national algorithm safety board, which would have a similar function to review AI failures in the medical world and financial and other things. So that's kind of a, a notion propagating. I don't expect really there to be a national algorithm safety board, but I'm very pleased to see that, you know, units of government agencies, NIST and SEC and FTC and FCC and HHS are all developing their own version of that. Second, benchmark test for verification and validation. Again, that's part of the ONR and DOD um, autonomy descriptions. That's good. Continuous improvement and process monitoring. Here, I would stress a more important thing, that if you need a, a process by which you continuously monitor and improve the systems that you're doing. So there needs to be open reporting things. One of the uh, FAA's virtuous things is a website where if you're a um, air traffic controller or a pilot and you've done something wrong or someone's done, you report it and report it openly. And so you get the feedback about near misses and problems. The, F, um, where is it? the FDA has a adverse event reporting system and thousands of reports come in every day about medications that have gone bad in unique situations for which they were not tested in clinical trials. And so you need to have a, a social system that does it. Software companies that are, you know, that build reliable software have internal processes by which they review and openly discussion, often have a single page that describes the most common bugs in this organization. So there are social structures you want to build around it. And then data quality and bias testing. This is particularly the Kathy O'Neill arguments, but uh, the, the potential for biased data to propagate future behaviors is, uh, you know, equally biased is, is the central issue there. Uh, again, those are longer issues. Now, there's a social framing that you want to put around these systems. It, you can't do it all just by the technical. You want to build a social structure. So, I mean, the idea of government regulation of an algorithm safety board and regulations can be problematic, but they can also trigger innovation and productivity. So, and generally accepted that automobile um, Regulations are required, safety and uh, seat belts and so on, crash testing, as well as uh, fuel efficiency, generally have been extremely effective and also productive of innovation. And so the right kind of regulations can, can do that as well. I think insurance companies may become our friends, whether it's medical insurance or uh, you know, other uh, that. I mean, just as the insurance industry has had a huge positive effect on building safety, over you know, the last hundred years. The building code is a detailed code and you appear before the zoning commission saying, I'm gonna build a building, I have adhere to the building code, and they say, okay, and then the, you build the building and the inspector arrives, checks to make sure you've you know, built it to the standard that you said, and, that has ha and then the insurance company says, we'll give you, you know, we'll insure your building and you get a certificate of occupancy. And so that kind of process for major AI systems, I think, would be another positive step. Uh, the third is we are seeing the movement of KPMG, Deloitte, PW, PricewaterhouseCooper, emerging to be the auditors for, for companies. Companies, reliable, large companies, actually want to do the right thing and they just need to know what it is that they should be doing, and so these companies are developing practices by which they become the social auditors. And now I'm not sure what the 
The variant of this will be within military situations, but the idea of having independent social structure that would supervise, independent oversight is a big phrase, not just oversight, but independent oversight, I think would be uh, very important. Military systems are challenged because it's very hard to test them under real world circumstances. And so that's always been a known problem. When David Parnas in 1971 testified against the anti-ballistic missile system, he said, you can't possibly test this thing. I think he successfully made the case that uh, at that point we couldn't test that kind of a generalized protection and, and the feeling of safety you had was incorrect because it couldn't be demonstrated under realistic situations. Um, voluntary industry plans, the partnership on AI is another, you know, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, and so on have stepped forward to try to do something about this. Unclear yet, you know, what they will do, but each of their leaders of those companies actually does want to do the right thing. And then I'd say the professional societies that promote education and ethics, maybe the best, if you're going to read one of the 200 reports that I've read, uh, is the IEEE's Ethically Aligned Design. It's 200 people working over several years. It's Ethically Aligned Design. It's called, and it's a really thoughtful, fresh thinking, fresh writing, fresh language that makes clear that it, the goal is to design systems that support people, that enable people to do what they need to do. Okay, that's one. The second thing is that people are social. And the operators of systems need to be able to consult with others, to collaborate, to get verification. Very true in a military situation. And the idea that you're going to have an autonomous system that works on its own or with a single operator seems narrow. And so the idea of community, cooperation, collaboration, contribution, consensus, all these words, another rich set of phrases, but I think that's where we're going. And we see this already in the huge growth of you know, all of these kind of tools. I'm not going to talk uh, at length about this, but um, understanding that people are social and when they're making difficult decisions, they need to have other people that they can collaborate with or call on or justify or build a connection with, share their current state, gain their advice. Um, I think you want, we, we see still, I still see many opportunities for this kind of expansion of participation at scale. Now the last part is my shakier argument here, but I've come to see that um, the, the thing that people really do is they go past the frontier, okay? Uh, that human creativity, you may know the language of the, there's islands of knowledge, there's the shoreline of wonder and the sea of mystery, maybe appropriate for a naval uh, environment. But, you know, most of the time we work on the islands of knowledge where things are pretty clear. Sometimes some people step out off the shoreline of wonder and others boldly go uh, off onto the sea of mysteries. And so the question is, how do we break out of the current ways of thinking and do things that go way beyond what machine learning based on training data could possibly give us. So, you know, these, these are transitions that happen over decades. Uh, the steamship gave way to the diesel train, to the gasoline engine, to electric cars, to trusted, reliable, and safe, safe self-driving cars. So that's kind of one set of transitions. And these would not have happened, these transitions wouldn't have happened by a machine AI Notion and similarly, computers were then wo woven to in 19 you know, computers in 1950, then became woven together in local area networks, which got woven together in the internet, the World Wide Web, social media, fake news, and on things you know beyond beyond all of that. And each one of these things is a leap. Now, sometimes the leap comes from you know people with positive, constructive, creative views, but you also have malicious actors. You have to remember, and maybe I don't have to say that in this audience, but the malicious actors often are the ones who make uh, clever exploitation of existing technology to go beyond what's usually expected. And that's where so real dangers are, and we have to understand that. And similarly, mainframe programs got to desktop applications, which gave way to websites and mobile apps. And what's next? So how do we move ourselves out? How does the Navy begin to think of technologies that go a step further? forward, a step beyond the current things that where training data and the past history are insufficient to give us the next substantial breakthrough. So 
you know, the evidence seems to come that you do this by studying real users doing their tasks and identify what their needs are, and then you recognize and you elicit the cre their creativity, social engagement, self-efficacy, and accomplishment, and you want to develop then the models and examples that are inspirational prototypes or metaphors, scenarios. The language matters a lot. Uh, I was suggesting there's the issue about responsibility, agency, control, and decisions. So while I think probably, I think most of you would say, no, computers are not responsible, although there are people who say they could be. Uh, computers are never responsible. Only individuals or organizations are responsible. And the courts have made that really clear. But a lot of people, or not a lot, some of the AI community would say, oh, yeah, well, computers are getting to be responsible. So then the question of agency or autonomy. Are computers, do we think of them as autonomous? Do they have agency? Can they act on their own? Do we see them as partners, teammates, and collaborators? If you do, then I think I have a problem with that. Okay. Now, more people would say control. Computers are in control. Uh, and they operate on their own, they're independent, and they do make decisions. So I would say, does a thermostat make a decision? I mean, here, no. I see some no. I mean, the computers, do we even use that language that we apply to humans to talk about, you know, a bimetal strip that clicks something on, or more sophisticated one? And so I would encourage you to think about the language you use and what you grant to machines or what you reserve for people. And while the literature of the last 60, 70 years is filled about how computers and people are getting to be similar, I am interested in thinking about how people and computers are different. For me, people are not computers and computers are not people. And understanding the differences to me helps me see through more clearly what the next step is. And that's the productive message. So um, you're going to design to support exploration. This could be combinatorial, adaptation of our existing ideas, exaptation, taking ideas from other domains, facilitating discussion, deliberation, speculation. Those are all the ways. OK, so just to close here, I just repeat that we're in a continuing discussion over the weighing out rationalism versus empiricism. And that still remains an issue. Both have value, remember that. Um, but we really need to consider the complex situations where context varies, where, uh, where you have to take an empirical approach rather than simply a logical, rational approach. I'm against humanoid robots. I think they will fade as superior designs appear. Excessive automation will give way to human control. At the same time, I believe clarifying responsibility does accelerate quality in lots of ways. Participation at scale delivers beneficial outcomes and frontier thinking enables. So that's the story um, of these pillars. And thank you for your time and attention.